Good afternoon. My name is Monica Pika with Sex Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Baxter and Sachs Communications, we want to thank all of the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to all of you, so thank you. I also want to show our audience how you can send questions in through the webinar. You can access the question and answer tab to the right side of your screen. If you have questions for our presenters, you can type them in the Q&A area. If you have a technical question, please type it into the tech tab. Our moderator today is Angela Craig. Ms. Craig is the critical care clinical nurse specialist for the ICU at Cookville Regional Medical Center in Cookville, Tennessee. She is also the sepsis coordinator for her hospital and is on the sepsis coordinator advisory committee for Sepsis Alliance. Ms. Craig has lectured extensively at numerous conferences and webinars on sepsis and hemodynamic topics. She has also published on the topics of sepsis and heart failure. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you guys are located. Thank you, Monica, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Getting the Fluids Right, Using Evidence to Guide Fluid Management. We have two exceptional speakers today, Nicole Kupchik and Kathleen Vollman. Nicole Kupchik is a clinical nurse specialist. She was formerly a Code Blue Committee chair. Currently, Nicole is a clinical consultant, and she is the author of six certification review books and numerous published papers. She is a contributing editor for AJN ECG Puzzles. Nicole has presented at numerous national conferences, including American Heart Association, Emergency Cardiovascular Care Updates, Society of Critical Care Medicine, National Teaching Institute, Emergency Nurses Association. Our other speaker is Kathleen Volman. Kathleen is a critical care clinical nurse specialist, educator, and consultant. She has published and lectured nationally and internationally on a variety of pulmonary critical care, prevention of health care acquired injuries, work culture and sepsis recognition and management. She is a subject matter expert for prevention of CAUTI, CLABSI, and HAPI, as well as sepsis recognition and management and the culture of safety for HRET and the Michigan Hospital Association. Ms. Volman was appointed to serve as an honorary ambassador to the World Federation of Critical Care Nurses. We do have a sponsor disclosure. This program is sponsored by and on behalf of Baxter Healthcare Corporation. The speakers have been contracted by Baxter Healthcare Corporation to present this material on Baxter's behalf. I have a few disclosures for the speakers. For Nicole Kupchik, she is a consultant and on the Speakers Bureau for Stryker Medical and Baxter Healthcare. For Kathleen Bowman, she is a consultant and on the Speakers Bureau for Stryker and Sage, Medi excuse me, Stryker Sage Medical and Baxter Healthcare. We do have continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. Accreditation statements are listed there on your screen, and support for this educational activity has been provided by Baxter, so we thank Baxter for that. And at this time, I would like to turn this presentation over to our first speaker, Nicole Kupchik. Thanks, Angela. I want to say good morning and good afternoon to many of you out there on the East Coast. Uh, I'm really excited to do this webinar. I'll be, I'm going to be co-presenting with Kathleen Bowman. So you might hear Kathleen and I kind of chatting back and forth just about different experiences, but uh, this is a two-part webinar series. The first webinar, which is today, we're going to chat about the evidence behind food management, and then the 
second webinar, Angela Craig, who you just heard from, and I are going to be presenting a couple of cases and applying everything we've learned. So we really hope you can join us. We've got information on the second webinar that we will be presenting um, at the end, so you can mark your calendars and join us for that one as well. All right, so to get started, learning objectives include, we're going to discuss the implications of over and under resuscitation of patients because both have dire consequences. We're going to talk about fluid management using evidence-based research and to talk about how you would apply that at the bedside. And then finally, we're going to demonstrate critical thinking of fluid management concepts through interactive polling and really all the, the case scenarios, many of them are going to come in the second webinar. So we're really excited to present that. Okay, so we, I want to hear from you. So I'm really, we want to know who is in the audience. So we're going to start a poll here. And um, we're wanting to know who is in the audience with us. So what's your clinical position? Are you a bedside nurse in critical care, progressive care, emergency? Do you work in acute care? Are you a respiratory therapist? Are you an educator? Are you a manager director or are you a clinical nurse specialist? All right, so the answers are rolling in. I love it. Okay, let's see. So I've got some answers rolling in. I'm going to finish up the poll in five seconds here. And we are going to finish. Okay, let's see what you all said. So 17% of you work in critical care. About 2% work in progressive care telemetry. 2% emergency department. Um, Looks like we've got 3% acute care. A lot of respiratory therapists online, which makes me happy. So 41%, 19% of you are educators, and then we've got about 8% directors and clinical nurse specialists. Okay. So with that, I'm going to just, we're going to just introduce the case. And then in the second webinar series, we're going to take this patient who's presented to the emergency department, and I'm going to kind of walk you through what happened clinically, but I want you to just kind of have a, a, a picture of a patient in your head. So you've got a 58-year-old who presents to the emergency department with productive cough, fever, and chills. So right away in my head, I'm thinking this could be sepsis, likely from pneumonia. And just as an FYI, pneumonia is the most common uh, source of infection that we see in hospitals. Um, the patient's given two and a half liters of lactated ringers. IV antibiotics are started. Uh, before we start the antibiotics, we got blood cultures, got a lactate, a CBC with a differential, and a procalcitonin level. So the vitals after given, giving uh, the fluid bolus, heart rate's 106, so kind of tacking away there. MAP is 60, so that's kind of on the lower side. Uh, we'd like to see that a little bit higher in most patients. Um, breathing 26 a minute, SpO2s are 91%. The patient's Oxygen needs increased significantly, and now they're on a 50% mask. Temperature is 38.6. So the initial lactate was 4.2 in the emergency department, and now the lactate is 3.8. The patient weighs 80 kilos, and the patient is lethargic. So what do you recommend? So given all of that information, I want to know what you recommend. So we're going to uh, launch another polling question here. And I would love to know, what do you think we should do? The patient already got two and a half liters of fluid, still hypotensive, I think they've got pneumonia. We know that sepsis is a vasodilatory type condition, which can lead to shock. So what do you think we should do? All right, the answers are rolling in here. So who's saying give another liter of fluid? Who's saying start a presser? Who's saying maybe both a fluid and a presser? And then who's saying I don't really have enough information to decide? All right, answers are rolling in. We'll give you five seconds to finish up here. And I'm going to close the poll and see what you all said. Okay. So um, looks like about 20% of you said give another liter of fluid. 22% said start a presser. About so you all split about a quarter, right? So about 23% are saying both fluid and presser, and 35% are saying I don't have enough information. And uh, being that we're going to talk about how to how to guide fluid management, I don't have enough information is actually really reasonable because what we want to know is is this patient volume responsive? Is their stroke volume going to increase? when we give them fluids. 
So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kathleen Volman, who's going to chat about fluids and consideration with fluids. Oh, Nicole, thank you so much. Um, you really set it up great. And the fact that fluids is a drug and we need to be far more specific in how we manage it than what we currently do. We need to ask some very specific questions about when do I actually give the fluid? Which fluid? Because the type and choice of fluid is going to make a difference. The amount of fluid is significant and is my patient going to respond to that fluid? Because if they're not volume responsive, then my choice may be a vasoactive drug. And so there are risks on both sides, which is why it's important to get it right. Because when we under-resuscitate patients, we know that not getting enough volume to the tissue means we don't get enough nutrients and oxygen there, so that altered tissue perfusion ultimately impacts various organ functions, including the kidneys, um, also uh, anastomosis leakage. It can create confusion because we've got hypoxia, a risk of CVA, splenic ischemia, uh, multi-system organ failure because we're not getting enough oxygen to the tissues, and ultimately circulatory collapse. So under resuscitation is not a good thing, but guess what? Neither is too much fluid. It can be extremely detr detrimental. And a lot of you may be experiencing this um, with the COVID patient right now in the fact that um, the virus is hitting directly to the lungs. And so we're really being far more careful with our fluid administration because if we volume overload the patient, that tends to increase the lung water and worsen the ARDS. Also, that peripheral edema that we're familiar with, the Michelin Man or the Pillsbury Doughboy, whichever one you remember learning about, is not, a, a, is not a, a bland thing. It really impacts how blood flows with that edema, and also that edema can um, go around the vessels in, in the renal area and contribute to acute uh, kidney injury. Uh, we see delirium with it, uh, as well as abdominal hypertension and compartment syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, and um, a, a correlation, most of the studies have been retrospective, but a correlation with increased ICU and hospital length of stay, as well as increased ventilator days. And you see this picture? Um, this is an individual that Nicole took care of in his 30s that came in for an appendectomy, ended up with significant uh, volume overload uh, as a result of resuscitation, and developed compartment syndrome. And he was literally having uh, significant trouble um, ventilating and as well as hypotension as related to this. So too much fluid can be detrimental. And so that's why it's really important to sit in the sweet spot. And that euvolemia or optimal fluid is, is more challenging <laughs> than we think. Uh, but we need to hit that spot because too little causes problems and too much causes problems. And so um, there was a study done looking at the Premier database, which uh, had about over 344 hospitals, and they excluded patients that received under one liter. And they analyzed the amount of fluids the patient got on the first day. And in this database that they were looking at over 20,000 patients with severe sepsis and septic shock, and they grouped them in those that got one to five liters and those that got above five liters. And what they were able to show is when you got five to nine liters in that first 24 hours, the mortality rate increased. 2.3% for every additional liter that was given over five liters. And when we look at total hospital costs, it was about $1,000 for every liter after five liters. So clearly, um, we can see a significant difference. Um, and however, in this study, there was no association with that first day fluid administration and increase in hospital ICU length of stay or um, a duration in mechanical ventilation. 
So when you think about it, um, and this is one of uh, Nicole's favorite words, holy wowzer. Um, so just think about the patients you care for and how many truly get over five liters in that initial resuscitation. Now, does this have an impact long term uh, on our patients? And this was a retrospective analysis that looked at 247 septic shock patients, and they defined volume overload as greater than 10% of admission body weight at discharge from the ICU. And what they found was 35% of those patients had volume overload at ICU discharge. And the average amount was about 12.5 liters, which is significant. And you can see that a lot of that occurred during shock, but also a lot of it occurred in fluid boluses after shock as well. But what blew my mind in this particular evaluation is that even though there was that large percentage of patients with diuretics, only 42% received or in with that amount of patients with fluid overload, only 42% received a diuretic. So that basically tells us that we're not taking the fluid off um, when we put too much on. And so this volume overload, and this is how it impacts long-term, this volume overload was associated with inability to ambulate at discharge, as well as a greater percentage of patients were, um, were discharged to a long-term care facility than discharged home. And so I don't know if you're aware, um, but this is put out by the International Fluid Academy on this concept of four phases of fluid resuscitation. And some of you may have seen this diagram before, where um, and it, the acronym is actually called ROSE. Uh, rescue, optimization, stabilization, and de-escalation, or it's oftentimes referred to as de-resuscitation. Got to tell you, we are pretty good at that um, rescue component of resuscitation. We give that initial bolus, but where I truly believe we need to get better at and where technology comes in is at the end of that rescue and into the optimization period where we can target by examining um, fluid, by examining our volume optimization and examining fluid responsiveness in our patient using technology so that we don't overload or underload as a part of it. In that stabilization phase, literally this is the homeostasis that we're going after, it's usually our maintenance fluids and sometimes replacing of those fluid losses. But where we really truly fall down in this journey is in that de-resuscitation or de-escalation phase where we where the patient themselves physiologically is having trouble getting the fluid off themselves. And as you saw in that previous study, that we weren't that good at removing it in the fact that only 42% of that population got, um, got diuretics. And I also believe in this phase, technology can help us in being able to determine when it's time to start removing that fluid, as well as when to stop, because we don't want to remove too much fluid. So I've got a polling question for you, and that is, um, which, so let's say you've got a um, patient that is hypotensive, and you're going to go into the physician saying, what kind of fluid are you ordering? What do I need to hang? And so what I would like you to do is ask the question or answer the question, what fluid would you expect to hang at your institution? Would it be sodium chloride? Would it be lactated ringers? Would it be plasma light A or would it be albumin? And the answers are rolling in. Okay, just another second. All righty. 
I'm going to finish that and share with you. Um, literally, uh, it looks like about 52% are hanging the sodium chloride, or uh, what is frequently referred to as normal saline. We'll talk about that. Lactated ringers, about 38%. Plasmolite about 6% and albumin about 3%. So why does that make a difference? Well, let's talk about some of the recent studies been published. Um, these are two studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, called SALT ID or ED and SMART studies. Both of them were conducted in Vanderbilt, um, a very large academic institution. So the SALT ED study was focused on non-critically ill patients in their initial resuscitation they, or the fluids that they received, about 13,500 patients, um, saline and what they were comparing with saline versus LR or plasmolite in these non-critically ill patients, and the medium amount of fluid administered was about 1,100 cc's. And then the SMART trial was in the intensive care population or the critically ill population, about 15,000 patients, where um, they compared saline versus LR or plasmolite in critically ill patients. And the median amount of fluid administered in the SMART study was about 2.5 liters. And in that population, about 33% of those patients were mechanically ventilated, about 25% on vasopressors. And what did both of these studies show? Both of them demonstrated the statistically significant increase in acute lung injury. So there is um, a marker. Uh, it is called Major Adverse Kidney Events, or MAKE, um, that was used in both of these studies, where they put together the amount of new renal replacement therapy, the amount of new AKA, or the impact on mortality. And so in the SALT ED trial, the, the major adverse kidney events, it was a number needed to treat of one out of 111 patients. So if you've not heard that statistic, number needed to treat, it basically turns um, the statistics that are sometimes difficult in the clinical papers that, that we read or the research papers that we read into a more user-friendly tool. So basically what that says is I have to treat 111 patients to prevent one patient from getting major adverse kidney events. And in the SMART trial, it was one out of 94. So you can see the choice of fluid is making a difference. And in the SALT ED trial, you can see there is the difference in the major adverse kidney events at 30 days. So clearly the kidney is injured by the type of solution we're using. And in the SMART trial, what they did is they did what was called a subgroup analysis to be able to compare um, saline and balanced crystalloids on this composite score of mortality AKI uh, and renal replacement therapy in various units based on where the patient was located, sepsis, traumatic brain injury. And what did the data show? Well, the data clearly showed that in sepsis, that there was a significant difference in this particular patient population. And that really led to them doing a secondary analysis in, in a separate um, study where they took those 15,000 patients that were enrolled in the SMART trial, and they pulled out the uh, 1,641 patients um, from the medical intensive care unit that were admitted with a diagnosis of sepsis. And what they found is that the hospital mortality for the patients with balanced crystalloids, so that's a combination of LR or plasmolite, even though uh, most of it was LR, the mortality rate was 26.3%, but in the saline group, it is 31.2%, showing clear statistical significance. What else showed out in this? Far better, as we talked about, major adverse kidney events, better in the balanced group, greater number of vasopressor-free days in the balanced crystalloid group, and less uh, renal replacement therapy required. So, We've got some 
um, prominent outcomes and some good secondary outcomes that's telling us the type of fluid does make a difference. We also have additional studies supporting moving away from saline that have been done on um, very specific patient populations like resuscitation and trauma or resuscitation in di uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so the data is clearly building up that the fluid choice, so not just the amount, um, when we do it, but also the choice of fluid makes a difference in our patient population. And so most of um, the response showed, or at least 53%, showed that we were using saline was the go-to choice um, in the resuscitation. But take a look at saline. Look at that pH. That is nowhere near normal. The sodium is nowhere near normal, and the chloride is off the charts. Normal plasma chloride runs between 94 and 111. As you move towards lactated ringers, you see the pH is getting a little, you know, is moving far closer to more normal pH. The sodium as well, and the chloride is more in normal range, and you get better, even closer, with plasmolite A. And so, um, right now, we have data that completely, that, that compares the saline and lactated ringers. What we don't have is data that compares the lactated ringers with plasmolite A. So I'm sure those are studies um, that are teed up to happen as a part of it. So I think the important message here is understanding in sepsis, your fluid choice truly does matter. And if you look, guys, how many of you ever had these little bags of Lay's potato chips? Yeah. So in one of those tiny little bags, the sodium is 170 milligrams. All of those bags, you, you, need, you eat all of those bags in one liter of normal saline. So the message here is, is to never, ever call it normal again, because there is nothing normal about saline. And when we talk about that issue that happens with saline in excessive chloride, there are uh, multiple physiological components um, that, are, uh, that happen with excessive chloride. You have a reduction in your renal blood flow, which then results in an increase in acute uh, kidney injury, which may result in the need for renal replacement therapy. There's also an association with increased risk for lung injury, and it has been shown as an independent factor for uh, risk factor for hospital increased hospital mortality. So excessive chloride, chloride does make a difference. So we're at another polling question, and so I'd like you guys to get ready to answer this one. Let's start it. All righty. So when you're in your clinical environment and you're taking care of a patient that may need fluids, may need vasopressors, what measures do you routinely use to determine if that patient needs fluid? Is it heart rate and blood pressure? Is it CVP? Is it CVP with SCVO2? Is it urine output? Is it Passive leg raise with stroke volume using um, either a single cuff technology or bioreactants, or is it ultrasound um, evaluating for the IVC collapsibility? And the answers are rolling in. So it's interesting to note, all right, got a lot of answers coming in, so I'm going to publish those. All righty. And what do we got? Well, heart rate and blood pressure, 37%. Um, we have other close, 27% for passive leg raise and stroke volume, which is awesome. Um, and we have 7% with CVP, about 10% CVP with SCVO2, and about 15% with um, urine output. So I'm going to hand it back to Nicole to talk about how we, we may get more specific on how we deliver that fluid and understanding if patients are truly fluid responsive. Okay. Well, thanks, Kathleen. So we'd love for you to, um, if you've got any questions, we're going to do a Q&A session at the end of this. 
But how many of you have ever been in a clinical situation where you're trying to decide? You've got a hypotensive patient. You know you've got to do something, and you're trying to decide, do I give this, meaning fluid, or do I start that, right? Do I start norepinephrine? Because we all know if we have to start norepinephrine, where does that patient need to go? The ICU. And so clinically, it can be quite challenging. Um, now, in two, it was the very end of 2016 into 2017, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign updated their guidelines. And for one of the first times, we saw a pretty bold statement that says, that suggests if shock is not resolving in your septic shock patients, um, to use a dynamic over a static variable to guide or predict fluid responsiveness. And so basically what this means is you need some sort of a stroke volume. We need to really move away using things like central venous pressure, which are, are more static measurements, and move to something that really says, what is your heart going to do with this fluid? Now, anytime you're trying to decide if your patient needs fluid, what you're really trying to figure out is where are they on that startling curve, right? So if we've got somebody who comes in through the emergency department, they've not gotten any treatment yet, they're septic, uh, they're hypotensive, it's pretty safe to assume that they're probably on the bottom of that startling curve and it would be safe to give fluid. But the problem comes once you challenge and give that patient fluid then where are they on the starling curve? Because the reality is we don't know. And once they get toward the upper part of that curve, we really need to stop giving fluid because basically what that's saying is our stroke volume is not going to improve with subsequent fluid challenges. And so using stroke volume, there's actually there's building evidence to really support it to use changes in stroke volume to decide whether your patient needs volume or whether you should start a presser. And in some cases, if they're in a low cardiac output state, maybe it means starting a positive inotrope like dibutamine. One of the things I wanna just challenge you and say is if you are giving your patient fluid because they're hypotensive, Putting fluid on an IV pump and setting it at 999 is not a fluid challenge. That is outdated practice and should be stopped. <laughs> if you are truly giving fluid because your patient is hypotensive, it should be administered as quickly as possible, ideally in less than 10 to 15 minutes. Now, limitations are always going to be the, the size of your IV line that, that you know, that to administer the fluid, um, but it should be something given rapidly. And then the other thing I'm going to talk about is how do we incorporate using the passive leg raise test to decide if our patient needs fluid. One of the things that's really interesting from a lot of the literature, and this has been demonstrated over and over and over again, um, once we give that initial fluid bolus, only about 50% of unstable patients still need more fluid. In fact, about half of the patients are no longer going to be fluid responsive, and so we probably need to move to, to pressors a lot earlier than we do in a lot of patients. Now, here's the reality clinically. I'm hoping this is going to change in the next few years. But clinically, I think many of us use heart rate and blood pressure to decide if our patient needs volume. But heart rate and blood pressure are both terrible predictors of fluid responsiveness. Heart rate can be affected by many medications people are on, for, um, for example, like for hypertension. Calcium channel blockers uh, will affect your heart rate. Dig will affect your heart rate. Um, as you get older, your sympathetic nervous system isn't as kind of revved up as it was when we were younger. And, um, and you're, so you may not see heart rate increases in, in older uh, patients. But in general, the literature is pretty clear. When we use blood pressure to guide fluid responsiveness, it often ends up in massive fluid overload. We really delay vasoactive therapy. And honestly, long term, it ends up with, you know, in higher mortality. So how many of you remember using central venous pressure to decide if your patient needs volume? Okay, so really interesting. Um, this is just a super quick stats lesson. And again, it's going to be super fast. But one of the things that we clinically, well, like let's say there's a research paper being published. Um, one of the statistical analyses that they will use is what's called a receiver operator curve. And one of the measures that's calculated is it's called the area under the curve. So basically this is, this predicts, 
fix how accurate your technology is going to be in predicting what you want it to predict. So for example, if something was a perfect predictor, so let's say like, so there's a lot of respiratory therapists on the call um, or on the webinar today, uh, capnography. So capnography to predict whether your endotracheal tube that has just been placed Capnography scores an area under the curve of a 1.0 to say that that tube is in the lungs versus the gut. So it scores, it's perfectly sensitive and perfectly specific to say lung versus gut. Now, if something scores an area, so 1.0 means it's a perfect predictor. And I will tell you, there are very, very, very few things clinically that are perfect predictors. In fact, I think the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is capnography to say your endotracheal tube is in the lungs versus the gut. Now, if something scores a 0.9 to 0.99, it means it's an excellent predictor. 0.8 to 0.89 means it's a good predictor. But there will be some margin of error anywhere from like 11 to 20%. If something scores a 0.7 to 0.79, it means it's a fair predictor. Anything that scores below a 0.7 should not be used clinically to make decisions. Now, I will tell you, for years, we used central venous pressure to decide if a patient needed volume. So interestingly enough, central venous pressure scores an area under the curve of a 0.56 to, to predict fluid responsiveness. So, it's, so using central venous pressure is about the equivalent of flipping a coin to decide to predict whether your patient will be responsive to fluid, meaning does your stroke volume go up, you know, when you receive that fluid? So, you know, does that mean we should never, ever, ever use CVP? No, I mean, but we shouldn't be using it to predict fluid responsiveness. Where is CVP helpful? If you've got somebody who's going into right-sided heart failure and you see a CVP that's elevating in pulmonary hypertension, it's helpful. But you should not be using CVP to predict fluid responsiveness. In fact, that's outdated practice and really should be abandoned. So how do things look over time? Because we've been studying sepsis pretty heavily the past 20 years. And what I, the way I want to orient you to this slide is basically looking at three different trials performed. You can see spaced out apart. So here's a trial from 2000, a trial from 2007, and a trial from 2014. And one of the things you, you, I, might, uh, I want to point out is that because of the literature, you can see using CVP to predict fluid responsiveness um, is really going down. So like back in 2000, uh, 2000, we used it over half the time. And then in 2014, it was only 11% of the time was it used. But one of the things that's consistently used is blood pressure. Even though we've got good data to say that blood pressure does not predict fluid responsiveness, we still rely on blood pressure. And I think it's time to look a outside of blood pressure to make decisions in fluid responsiveness. So what should we be using? Well, there's lots of different options, um, but we should be using something that reflects stroke volume. And just remember, stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected from your heart with each beat. And the term stroke volume optimization is a term I want you to become comfortable with because really this is what the literature is demonstrating we should be using to guide fluid management. So there's lots of different options to measure stroke volume or, or to estimate stroke volume. So ultrasound, so you might see providers using ultrasound below the diaphragm to assess the inferior vena cava and the collapsibility. Now, I will tell you that that's commonly done. There is margin error. A lot of it's dependent on the skills of the provider of measuring ultrasound, but that's an option. Bioreactance, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second, is another great option. Um, you might hear it called NICOM, non-invasive cardiac output measurement. Um, there's digit or continuous cardiac output blood pressure devices that are on the fingers we could use. There's art line technologies. And there's um, end tidal CO2 or capnography to predict fluid responsive. But the one thing we should really get away from is relying on heart rate and blood pressure to predict fluid responsiveness. So one of those things right now, it's kind of a big popular saying, you know, is, is stroke volume the sixth vital sign? Meaning, you know, should we be relying on it far more than we are now? And I, I honestly think the answer is yes. So let's kind of, um, I'm going to walk through a case and some literature uh, around stroke volume optimization with the passive leg raise. So 
if you've ever uh, done the passive laborers, um, great. Um, I want to say if you're going to use PLR, you should not be using blood pressure and heart rate heart rate with a passive leg raise to decide if your patient needs fluid. But to properly con uh, conduct a passive leg raise test, now remember it's a test, it's not a treatment, this is a test. What you would do is put the patient's head of the bed up, 45 degrees, you can kind of see in the, the diagram here, with their legs straight, and get a baseline stroke volume. Then what you want to do is drop the patient's head and lift their legs. And what, an important thing you need to tell the patient if they're you know, if they're awake and able to cooperate with you, is you need to advise them, do not help me lift your legs. Because if they help you, they engage their muscles, which can alter the test. Because it will, in, in, by engaging their muscles, they'll increase mean of return. But what you want to do is lift the legs. And what you're doing is you're taking that volume in their legs and lower abdomen, you're pushing it back to the heart to give the heart a challenge. And a lot of the literature estimates that this is the equivalent of giving a 300cc fluid bolus. But it's a very transient test, so you really need to reassess stroke volume. Again, you're going to get a baseline, lift the legs, and you need to reevaluate that in under three minutes. It's a super. It's a very transient change that you will see. And what you're trying to identify is does with this leg raise, does the stroke volume go up by at least ten percent or more? And if your patient's hypotensive you lift their legs and their stroke volume increases by 10% or more, that's a sign they'll be fluid responsive. However, if it doesn't go up by 10% and your patient's hypotensive, that's where we should start a vasopressor or increase the vasopressor if they're already on one. So now, who wouldn't this test be applicable to? Um, if you've got somebody with intra-abdominal hypertension, uh, that wouldn't be the best patient to do this. If they've got head trauma or intracranial pressure issues, if they've got a lower extremity deep vein thrombosis, um, if they've got venous compression stockings on, those should be taken off uh, before you do this test. If they've had an amputated leg, and you know, for obvious reasons, they're not going to have volume there, so uh, too displaced. And then finally, if your pa patient is severely hypovolemic with massive hemorrhage, um, they may not have enough intravascular volume to see a change. So those would be some limitations to the passive layer test. In those types of cases, what you could do is put a stroke volume measure on the patient and then rapidly administer a fluid bolus very rapidly to see if there's any change in their stroke volume. So what? how accurate is this passive leg raise test? Well, there was a meta-analysis that was published a, number of year, uh, a few years ago, and they uh, took the results from 21 different studies that assessed the passive leg raise test using stroke volume and cardiac output, and then also they included pulse pressure. And basically what they were able to demonstrate by conglomerating all of these studies together is that when the passive leg raise was used with a stroke volume or cardiac measure, it predicted fluid responsiveness and received an area under the curve score. So remember AUC, I talked about that a couple slides ago, the AUC was 0.95. So that score tells you that using the PLR with a stroke volume or cardiac output measure is highly predictive if your patient will or will not be a fluid responder. Now, when you use the passive leg raise test with pulse pressure changes, so remember that's relying on the blood pressure and pulse pressure is systole minus diastole, and looking at those changes, it doesn't perform as well. It scores an area under the curve of a 0.77. So really, we should be looking at some sort of a stroke volume measure. Okay, so now we're back to our 58-year-old who I introduced in the beginning. So remember, this patient um, had pneumonia, they got uh, labs, they got IV fluids, they got a, a two and a half liter um, bolus, they got IV antibiotics. So their mass was pretty borderline, so it was 60. Um, breathing 26 a minute, SpO2 was 91%. Remember the oxygen needs were going up. Patients lethargic, lactate still 3.8. So I'm not comfortable sitting with a map of 60 and a lactate of 3.8. Um, so what we did was we placed bioreactance technology on this patient. So it's basically patches you place above and below the heart, and the top patches or electrodes 
basically send, send out a signal. And then um, over a couple of different phases and phase shifts, the bottom patches will calculate the stroke volume and cardiac output. And so, again, what you want to do is head of the bed up, get a, a baseline stroke volume, then drop the head, lift the legs for about a minute to two to three minutes at the very most. And if that stroke volume increases by 10% or more, then I'm going to treat that hypotension with fluid. But if it doesn't go up by 10%, then I'm going to treat that hypotension by using a vasopressor. And so we're back to our patient. So we got kind of a baseline. Uh, so with the head of about up 45 degrees, legs straight, you see, again, MAP was 60. Their uh, stroke volume was 122. So that's a normal is usually about 60 to 100. So that's, that this is telling me that this patient is hyperdynamic. So kind of in a high cardiac output state. The TPR, which is total peripheral resistance, is basically equivalent to your afterload. That's only 522, so that's telling me the patient's vasodilated. And this is exactly what I would expect to see in a patient who's got septic shock. So that was with head of the bed up, legs straight, then we dropped the head and lifted the legs. And within, you could see just very quickly, the index went up a little bit, the stroke volume just went up a tiny bit. So this is definitely less than 10%. So if I have a stroke volume increase that's less than 10%, how would I treat this patient's hypotension? I would start a vasopressor. And what's the vasopressor of choice in sepsis? It's norepinephrine, yes. And, but, you know, but, and a lot of times you might think, well, gosh, this patient only got one dose of fluid. Let's just keep giving fluid. But actually, when we used a stroke volume measure, we tested the patient's heart, and their stroke volume didn't go up with that physiologic, air quote, fluid, fluid bolus. So this patient's telling us they're not going to be, they're no longer going to be responsive to fluid, start a vasopressor. And um, so Xavier Monet, who's pretty amazing, he's a physician out of Europe, um, kind of came up with this algorithm and just, you know, and, and this is exactly what I just walked you through. So is you know, is there low blood pressure or um, cardiac output? And this patient had low pressure actually in a hyper uh, dynamic state. Was there signs of tissue hyperperfusion? Yeah, this patient's lactate still 3.8. Um, is hypovolemia obvious? And for this patient, we were beyond that initial phase. So then we asked ourselves, you know, could this patient be fluid responsive? We did the passive leg rate test. And basically, this patient was no longer fluid responsive, so we needed to resort to a vasopressor, i.e. norepinephrine. Now, the University of Kansas, so this is super interesting, a few years ago uh, had conducted this trial. This is a before and after trial. Uh, and what they did was they enrolled 191 patients. So 91 patients got usual care. So if you can imagine kind of a progressive point in time, for about a year, they evaluated 91 patients who got air quote usual care, meaning you know, you just did what you normally do clinically at the bedside. They might, might have used heart rate and blood pressure to decide if the patient needed fluid. And then for the next year, they used bioreactants or the technology I just showed you, the non-invasive cardiac output measure. And for the next 100 patients, they used that bioreactants in the, and they started in the emergency department with a lot of these patients to guide fluid responsiveness. So interestingly enough, what they found was after that first flu bowl, it's only about half of patients still needed volume, uh, meaning that they didn't have a stroke volume increase of at least 10%. And when they compared, so you can see this black line here is the group that had a stroke volume measure to guide fluid responsiveness versus usual care. When they used a the stroke volume measure, these patients got on average three and a half liters less fluid by using stroke volume. Uh, their vasopressor needs when using the non-invasive cardiac output measure were decreased by 33 hours. Their need for mechanical ventilation, okay, respiratory therapist listening to this webinar, this is pretty impressive, but when we didn't fluid overload these patients, they cut their need for mechanical ventilation by 51%. Again, you know, we have capillary leak in sepsis, and patients end up in the kind of this ARDS type picture, or with, or with ARDS, really. And then the length of stay when using a non-invasive cardiac output measure was dropped by 2.89 days. And that, that 
and it really ends up to be quite a major financial uh, cost. So Kathleen, I'm going to hand it over to you. And Kathleen is going to talk about a brand new study that literally hot off the press was just published where they kind of took the model that was used in the KU study and did a non-blinded randomized, it was an international study, but it was a non-blinded randomized control trial. So Kathleen, you ready to talk, tell, tell them about their fresh trial? Sure, Nicole. Thank you so much. And actually, the Kansas um, Kansas City uh, or Kansas University trial really uh, set this up or served as as the foundation to help with the methodology of the Fresh trial, which is uh, fluid responsiveness evaluation in sepsis associated hypotension. And I said that all <laughs> in a in a single breath. Um, there were 13 U.S. and U.K. hospitals that participated, a total of 124 patients, and 83 were in the treatment group and 41 received usual care. So they had what was called a two-to-one enrollment, so two patients in um, the uh, PLR stroke volume uh, fluid assessment strategy versus uh, whatever they did as usual care, as Nicole talked about, whether it was blood pressure, heart rate, CVP, whatever was usual in those environments. And they enrolled in the ER, and the patients that they were going after were those that were refractory and septic shock that had received less than three liters of initial fluid administration because they wanted to capture um, if patients got too much fluid already, um, it wouldn't allow us to really show how optimization of fluids um, is, you know, shows a difference. And so they used uh, passive leg raise with the dynamic measurement of stroke volume change using bioreactant technology um, that Nicole talked about. And they used it to guide decisions of if the patient was fluid responsive, then they would get fluid administration. If they weren't, um, then they would get vasopressors based on presence of clinical hypoperfusion. And they defined that clinical hypoperfusion as a MAP less than 65. Uh, persistent high uh, elevated lactate or cryptic shock, which was a lactate greater than four without the presence of hypotension. And they followed these and managed the patients these ways, oh, this way over the next 72 hours or to ICU discharge, whichever one came first. And so the, the goal here was could stroke volume guided uh, fluid management give or make a difference in the patient population? And so the primary endpoint was looking at that, um, and they were able to show a significant decrease in 72-hour fluid balance, um, less in the treatment group than the control group at about 1.37 liters. Not a huge amount of fluid, but you're going to see the impact that had. And like the Kansas City um, trial and like the previous literature Nicole talked about, about 50% of the patients are, are roughly fluid responsive uh, on initial passive leg raise, and that's exactly what um, the FRESH trial showed. 43% were fluid responsive on the initial passive leg raise. 33% were fluid responsive uh, between a 48 to 72 hour window, and there were 18% that were never fluid responsive. They also measured a number of significant um, secondary endpoints they were able to show statistical significant reduction in the use of renal replacement therapy in the treatment group. Um, and for the respiratory therapists, very much like the uh, University of Kansas trial, um, there was significantly less mechanical ventilation in the, in the treatment group. ICU length of stay was not different um, from a statistical perspective, but I would say anybody would consider um, almost three days uh, reduction in length of stay, uh, a financial and clinical benefit. And interesting enough, the, uh, again, treatment group showed a statistical significance in long-term outcome in terms of being able to be discharged home uh, more than the control group. And I wanted uh, to sort of set this up um, and draw your eyes to the blue on the left-hand side, looking at ICU length of stay, mechanical ventilation risk, and acute dialysis uh, therapy initiated. All of those are cost points for our intensive care 
patient. So there was a cost analysis done with the KU study, and they found roughly about a three-day reduction in length of stay, which was about $9,000 in cost savings. And if you take a look at the FRESH trial, you're also seeing that three-day reduction in length of stay. Mechanical ventilation risk, the relative risk reduction was about 51%. It was 48% in the FRESH trial. And for uh, acute dialysis therapy, the relative risk uh, reduction was 68%, and it was 71% in the FRESH trial. So the money that was saved showing the patient per patient saving in the University of Kansas trial really can transfer over to the FRESH trial. So the savings uh, per treated patient was uh, close to $15,000. Now, it's exciting to note that um, there are continual studies going on right now. The PLUS trial looking at uh, saline and acetate uh, glutamate buffered crystalloid on 90-day mortality in general ICU patients. The BASIS trial, uh, 11,000, uh, looking at the rapid or slower infusion of resuscitation. And the CLOVIS trial, which is looking at liberal crystalloid fluid resuscitation or early vasoactive. So some of the, we may get some additional answers as we build the body of evidence for these patients. And so I'm going to hand it back to Nicole to take it home um, with yeah. some very critical take home points from our talk. Yeah, I just well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. So get your questions. We're probably going to go over by five minutes. Um, because it's uh, we're almost to the end here, but you know I think just some baseline take home points from this is that first of all the passive leg raise test is safe and it can easily be done. It it tells us a lot about what's happening with the patient's heart. Um, using the passive leg raise test with a stroke volume measure reduces fluid balance at 72 hours. It reduces the total amount of fluids that patients are given, which leads to improved outcomes, less mechanical ventilation, less renal replacement therapy, and hopefully we can get more patients home. And again, the KU trial, which you know, do we with a trial that was done to see is there a signal there, then was you know, came to fruition with a fresh trial. So we're seeing some pretty positive results using stroke volume. So now who knew, who knew that there was an international fluid academy, but here you go. There's actually an international group, which you could become a card holding member. Um, but and I say this kind of jokingly because it's just, it's so interesting. I mean, like 10 years ago, I, I think most of us were like, who cares about fluid? Just give more fluid, fluid for everything, right? But we know that fluid overload uh, it has massive detriments, and so this organization is is dedicated to really getting the research out there and information out there about fluid in general. And so bottom line, I just want you to remember, fluids are a drug. You would never give insulin without checking a glucose. And so in the future, I'm really hoping that we would think of fluid as a drug in the same way, in that I wouldn't give a fluid bolus unless I knew that the patient's heart was going to respond to it and their stroke volume would go up. So in conclusion, you know, again, under over resuscitation with fluid is detrimental. We need to stop guessing on fluid administration. Stop using heart rate. Stop using blood pressure to decide if your need, patient needs fluid and go more toward a stroke volume measure. So with that, Angela is going to guide us through some of the questions you all have and give you some information on continuing education. Your credits for CE. Sorry about that. Thank you, Nicole and Kathleen, for an awesome and interesting and thought-provoking presentation. And really quickly, before we begin our Q&A session, I would like to remind the audience how they can obtain their CEs for this activity. So you are, just a moment here, has been approved for 1.0 contact hour. You can go to sacstesting.com slash RB, and you'll need to register on that test site and then complete the evaluation form. Upon successful submission, RTs and nurses will be able to print your certificate um, on completion. We will have an archive on-demand version that will be available as well. Um, so just know that that's going to be available and on demand, and it will be accredited um, for nurses and respiratory therapists as well. 
All right, so we are going to start our question and answer session, and you guys get ready. We've got some good ones, and I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to try to um, I'm going to try to just quickly ask these questions. Laura asks, "What is our end goal?" She thought a map of sixty was good. Um, what are your thoughts on that, you guys? I, you know, I think clinically, what's our end goal? Our end goal is to have a patient who is not going into end organ dysfunction. Some patients, maybe a map of 60 is fine, but in general, I know in the sepsis guidelines, we've hit it, um, it's been suggested to, to hit a target of at least 65. But I will safely say in a patient who's chronically hypertensive and poorly controlled, a map of 65 is not adequate. Conversely, maybe somebody, a little old lady who runs hypotensive as a baseline, maybe a map of 60 is okay for them. And I really think we need to go more toward um, just targeting whatever map works for that patient. Um, you know, so I, I don't think there's a one size fits all for everyone. I would say in a lot of our patients, a map of 60 is probably on the low side, although there's been some recent data saying that in some patients that might be okay. Kathleen, anything else you'd add to that? Well, it's, it's, it's really about that personalization of care. Um, it, guidelines, guidelines, and I'm a firm believer in guidelines um, because they address the 80-20 rule. Um, but as Nicole described, we've got the 20 on either side or the 10 on either side um, that need to be looked at and have their targets specified. Okay, excellent. We've got a lot of comments in regards to um, plasma and, excuse me, plasma light. Um, someone had, Paige had asked about how available this was for hospitals, what's the cost, et cetera. And I can speak for myself that we, I do not have plasma light available at my site. Um, what, a, what about you guys for the people you're working with? Are there, is there availability? Are you hearing about that? Well, just, say, you know, um, every hospital oh, is different. Check with yeah. your, I'll tell you who uses plasma light, anesthesia. And, um, you know, so check with the OR. Um, I, I think you should work with your purchasing department to, to evaluate if you have it, what the cost difference is. But I would, I'm going to guess most hospitals have it, but you just may not have it in your unit. And it is, it is more expensive. But, um, again, um, I don't know if there are studies going on uh, directly head-to-head -head between plasma light and LR, but that's the next step so that we can see if one is superior to the other. Absolutely. Because that will change, um, that will change practice. Yes, definitely. And that was another question, so thank you for asking that. I'm going to ask maybe two more questions. I know we have to hurry, but um, well, somebody, quite a few people have been asking about different contraindications for, for PLR. One mentioned for pelvic and spine fracture. Another one mentioned for their hip fracture patients, how quickly after their hip fracture can we do passive leg raises. So can you guys speak to the contraindications to that test? Yeah. I I agree. So an unstable spine is an absolute contraindication. Um, hip fracture, you'd have to check with the patient's surgeon um, on their mobility limitations. Um, but spine instability isn't like, yes, do not lift the patient's legs. So in that type of a case, you can do what I described where you, you challenge the patient with fluid using a stroke volume measure and just see if their stroke volume goes up. So that would be your alternative in those patients who have contraindications. And, the, you know, the, the, purpose, the purpose of the PLR, um, you know, of using that versus a, a volume challenge, you know, an external volume challenge is to reduce the risk of the patient getting more fluid than they actually need and using your own biological fluid. Yes. Yes. Um, and you guys, just due to time, I know it's 12.05. I'm probably going to have to hand this over. There are still some really amazing questions out here. Um, the last one I do want to just mention, because I think this is so important, 
Paige asks, what are your thoughts about using PPV and stroke volume variation for fluid management? And I would just like to speak personally to that. I would say go with your stroke volume optimization in the, criti in the ICU majority of the time, um, just due to the respiratory variation and due to the fact that if you're over-breathing the vent, it may alter um, how the decision-making points. Does anybody want to speak to that as well? Yeah, I absolutely will. So, so if you've got um, an arterial line technology, we're using PPV or um, SVV. You so it, there's a lot of rules that have to happen to use PPV and SVV. So, but regardless, what you still can use is the stroke volume and cardiac output measurement you're getting from that same technology. So if you've got a patient who's overbreathing the vent or has an open chest or, um, you know, those types of situations, I would then just look at your stroke volume measures from your art line technologies and use those with the passive leg raise test. Yes. Sounds great. Well, I, I could keep going on and on, but I know we can't do to the sake of time here. But thank you guys so much for answering all these questions. And we are going to hand this um, over to Monica. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this does conclude our webinar for today. I'd like to remind the audience that there is a survey for you at the conclusion that will pop up immediately which should be popping up right now. And we would greatly appreciate sharing, you sharing your opinion on today's webinar. We thank you again on behalf of our presenters, Sex Healthcare Communications, and our sponsor, Baxter. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.